Good evening. Uh, to begin with my routine announcement that any of you that would like to uh, acquire a cassette of this evening, uh, sound photosynthesis is taking this. I think it's an audio cassette, possibly also a video cassette. A video cassette as well, and, and these are available immediately after the lecture, and they'll be at the table uh, just outside the doors if you would like to speak to them about that. Uh, on behalf of the California Institute of Integral Studies, I'd like to welcome you to our Tuesday evening with Colin Wilson. Normally we're on Friday evening. Uh, three times our institute has had the distinct uh, pleasure of welcoming Colin and his wife Joyce to San Francisco and the city with a historical affinity with the creative outsider. Uh, and earlier English writer E.M. Forster uh, once claimed that there are two types of people, those who divide people into two types <laughs> and those who do not. <laughs> uh, in Colin's case, the two types are either zealous admirers or those who have yet to read him. <laughs> but even uh, long-time readers uh, continually enjoy meeting new sides of Colin Wilson and of his writing. Uh, those who know him as a pioneer of positive existentialism, uh, for example, would enjoy meeting the creator of some of the best English imaginative fantasies since Tolkien. Uh, his recent publication, The Spider World, is a sort of force of the imagination, which I cannot recommend highly enough. It's a kind of book you cannot put down. Um, those who know him as a watershed figure in what is uh, now called in California humanistic and transpersonal psychology, and that's my first sense of Colin, I uh, would be pleased uh, to meet uh, the, one of the most persuasive historians of the occult of our century. And then, of course, there's his uh, devotees of his encyclopedias of crime, murder, and psychic detection. And they would relish the Colin Wilson who would fathom the intricacies of wine uh, or music. One reviewer, and this is my favorite uh, comment on Colin Wilson of a British newspaper, uh, claimed that Colin could make the telephone directory into exciting reading. <laughs> <laughs> when one reads him, there's the curiously satisfying aesthetic experience of seeing a keystone slide into place and securely holding to otherwise precarious arches and graceful balance. I think that image sums up Colin's uh, writing. Uh, a writer of 70 books uh, crafted with characteristic clarity, Colin is at the height of his powers in his most recent publication, in particular, Beyond the Occult. I want to stress the significance of that book. If uh, we follow his conclusions in the second part of this book, based on the field he has integrated in the first part, I think Colin's significance will begin to dawn on, on us, and in California particularly. I wrote to Colin earlier this summer in England and suggested uh, the mysteries of human consciousness for the title of tonight's lecture. And of course, he wrote back to me saying that he and his son Damon were currently gathering material for the new volume of Encyclopedia's Unsolved Mysteries. So whether the mystery is solved or unsolved tonight, I'm convinced that with uh, Colin's cheerful temperament, we're uh, certain to have uh, an evening of the life for entertainment. So please join me in welcoming Colin Wilson. <coughs> well, that's good. Thank you, Michael. I always worry when I come to San Francisco because I remember what I said last time and feel that, you know, I should try not to repeat myself on the assumption that many of you have heard me before and more or less remember the kind of things I've said. Uh, over the past two years, I've, I think, come a upon some of the most interesting insights of my life since I was here last. But before I talk about them, I want to give a sort of brief, quick overall view of, you know, what my writing is about, 
and uh, how I approach it. So you know that my first book, The Outsider, came out in 1956 and was basically about this problem of people, I called outsiders, which meant people who felt alienated from society because they, as I said at the beginning, saw too deep and too much. They felt that most people only succeeded in remaining sane because they had somehow filtered out most of the really deep problems of human existence. And that all of these people in the 19th century who interested me so much, from Goethe on down to W.B. Yeats and, you know, the sort of lost generation of Ernest Dowson and Verlaine and Rambo and so on, that all of these people had had deeper visions that to some extent wrecked them and made them incapable of handling ordinary everyday life. Now, what had obsessed me from the beginning was that the moods of visionary consciousness, these moods of intense happiness and ecstasy, which every child gets on Christmas morning, should in some sense be reproducible. And that, if you could suddenly go to the heart of it and hang on to it firmly and never let go of it, our lives would be completely transformed. But this is our problem, that we let go too easily. Let go of the moments of intensity, certainty, what one commentator called, you know, the internal sense of power, meaning and purpose. It seemed to me that if only we could hang on to these things, it would be all so simple. And that's why my first novel, uh, out of which everything else sprang, a thing called Ritual in the Dark, started off with a young man who was bored sick with his job in an office in the West End of London, and who felt that if only he could just have uh, a small quantity of money, a room of his own, and books and records, he would be ideally happy. Then he gets it, and suddenly he finds that he's curiously bored. There's a kind of collapse. You know, he, he's glad to be free, but there's not the intensity that he expected. And this seemed to me to be the fundamental problem of human existence. Um, at one point, I called it the Agnar Mikla paradox. After that Norwegian young writer Agnar Mikla, who became very famous um, in the early 1950s with a series of books in Norway, which were really based around the works of the American Thomas Wolfe. And Mikla pouring out this autobiographical stuff was a tremendous success, except that he shocked the Norwegians so much with his frankness in sexual matters that um, he was wildly attacked and disappeared like a stone. I don't know what he's written since um, the late 1950s, if anything. But one of his early books was a book called The Hotel Room, in which a young man knocks on the door of a girl and says, look, I've got to talk to you, you're in danger. There's somebody in this hotel who is after you. And she says, who? And he says, me, and leaps on her <laughs> and hurls her on the bed. And they struggle around for about 20 minutes or so. She's in a nightgown, and he's in a state of intense sexual excitement. And a point comes where he says, now look, you know, if you're not very careful, um, you're going to become pregnant. And at this point, she suddenly surrenders and says, OK, um, I see your point. And uh, she gets up and puts in a contraceptive. And as soon as he smells the contraceptive, it's not that his desire disappears, but it deflates considerably. This is not what a moment before he was experiencing. And he makes love to her and enjoys it, but it's just not the same thing. Now, that I call the agnomical paradox, because this appears to be the problem of human consciousness. This tendency, when you're on the point of getting what you want badly, to suddenly, as it were, feel, you know, so what? and just let it collapse. <laughs> Not necessarily collapse completely, although it can do that. I was always fascinated by that story of Gilles de Maupassant called um, The Unknown, in which a man keeps seeing a beautiful girl, 
wandering around um, the village and is so obsessed by her that he feels the one thing he really wants to do is to get her into bed. Uh, he finally succeeds in attracting her attention one day when she was standing by a shop window and then to his astonishment instead of resisting she more or less agrees to go back to his room so he's already you know a little suspicious <laughs> and when they get back to her room uh, she undresses with her back to him and he sees that down the center of her back she has a very fine line of dark hair and for some weird reason this puts him off completely and he says, when the time came to sing my song of love, I had no voice. And the girl looks at him contemptuously and says, Monsieur, if you're incapable, why did you invite me here? And sweeps out. Now, that seemed to me to be the essence of the problem of human existence. That we are capable of wanting something badly. And then on the point of getting it, we lose the inner pressure and suddenly no longer want it. Obviously what happens in some odd sense is that we leak like a punctured tire. Human consciousness is always working itself up to some intensity and if the thing that you want is so difficult to get that you are forced to concentrate totally and you are never sure whether you're going to get it or not then when you finally get it, it is a consummation. If before you get it, you suddenly have the feeling, okay, it's all right, quite suddenly, ugh, the inner collapse. This, you see, is what made Schopenhauer say in The World as Will and Idea that um, all human desire is based upon delusion and that human life is fundamentally an illusion that the will has this tremendous drive after objects of desire and that when we get them we no longer want them. In other words, it's a kind of Buddhism. I must say a religion that I've always detested. And, <laughs> you know, simply because um, Buddhism seems to me to be based upon this notion that the only way in which we can be free is freeing ourselves of objects of desire, which you know is very good for a sort of teenager who is obviously obsessed by objects of desire but if you get beyond this stage and are able to control yourself to a certain extent, then quite suddenly, you know, positive objects begin to appear. You begin to see there's a possibility of doing something real. And the notion of sitting back, emptying yourself of all desire, and then sort of drifting off into a state, you know, of deep meditation or whatever, seems to me very unsatisfactory. <laughs> <sighs> So, I could see fairly clearly from the beginning that this was the basic problem of human beings, that we simply let out our pressure at the essential moment. And that the reason we do this is perfectly simple. We all possess in our unconscious minds a kind of robot which does things for us. And if you learn French or if you learn to drive a car or if you learn to type or whatever, you have to do it painfully step by step. And then the robot takes over and does it much faster than you could possibly do it. The only trouble is if you try to interfere once the robot has done it, he screws you up completely. As soon as the conscious mind interferes with your instinctive processes, everything goes wrong. Now, the thing is that most human beings are approximately 50% robot and 50% what you might call real you. And when you are deeply interested in something, there's that feeling, you know, of a 50-50 balance. Um, you know, I mean, I'm now talking to some extent on the robot. My mind is sort of grabbing inside me words, intuitions and all the rest of it and turning them into um, verbal expression in a purely mechanical way. But if I become tired, then quite suddenly my brain won't function properly. And if I tried to lecture on the robot, everything would go wrong. I must keep 51% real me and 49% robot. And if I really get happy and carried away, then suddenly it's 52% real me, or 53% real me, and only 47% robot. And then, you know, I really feel that curious feeling of freedom, which you get 
in all moments of emergency. When you feel that if only this problem would go away, I would be totally happy. You know, um, Hans Keller, who was the head of BBC Music, said that before the Second World War, as a Jew in Germany, he had this feeling that he was likely to be arrested and thrown into a concentration camp at any time. And Keller said in a BBC broadcast that he said to himself, oh my God, if only I could get out of Germany, I promise that I would never be unhappy again for the rest of my life. And of course he did get out of Germany, and being a nasty little man, he was unhappy for the rest of his life. <laughs> in some way we cannot live up to our promises. <laughs> and this is the main problem. You see, we're back again to this fact that if the emergency remained, you would remain in that state of 51% real you. The moment the emergency disappears, you sink down to 50% real you and 50% robot. And then the moment that you get a little tired or relax a little too much, suddenly you're 49% real, you are 51% robot. And yeah, this does no harm. When you're relaxed, it works fine. The robot drives your car for you, takes you home, and you don't even realize you're, you know, how you've driven home. It's a marvelous innovation, but the problem is that the robot keeps on taking over all these things that we should really be doing ourselves. With the real you. Because when you are doing things with the real you, you are somehow recharging your vital batteries in the same way that you recharge your car's batteries when you drive the car. Whenever you do things on the robot, you don't recharge the batteries. The result is that you can sink lower and lower and get more bored. And this is our basic problem as human beings. We are the most complex organism that has appeared so far on the surface of the Earth. And because we've achieved this incredibly high level of control over ourselves, we have a far more complex robot than any other creature on the surface of the Earth. The robot does all kinds of things for us. You see, if an Elizabethan man could come back nowadays and see us, he would think that we were all incredible geniuses, almost gods. You know, even I, when I first came to America and just heard the American vocabulary, I was fascinated by it. Because in England, you know, we're so <laughs> relatively stupid in that respect. You suddenly realize that you are able to handle a complexity of existence that would have completely destroyed someone in the early 19th century. And that, you see, for me, was a very important clue. Because when I was writing The Outsider, what fascinated me so much were all these people in the early 19th century who quite suddenly had these visions of great intensity. The Goethe's and Schiller's and Hoffman's and, and Tieck's and Avalis's who suddenly had these wonderful visions of life lived at a far higher level of ecstasy. And then woke up the next morning and said, what was that all about? And felt that it was all an illusion. Now, you see, the interesting thing was, this was relatively new. In fact, no, relatively new. It was new in human history. It had only existed for 60 years in the year 1800. You see, what has happened to human beings is extremely interesting. Over the past 4,000 years, there has been a total transformation of our consciousness, which has turned us into a new type of creature. We are now something completely new. The only thing is we don't know it, or well, most of us don't know it. As soon as we know it and recognize it, the change will suddenly take place in a single leap. And I believe it's already taking place. There's certain people already know it, and that within the next 50 years, you're going to see man evolve to a higher stage, that we're going to produce a different type of human being. Not just man, but woman too, because in a sense, woman is the key to this peculiar enigma. Let me try to explain what I mean. When Cro-Magnon man came on the earth something like 50,000 
BC, he was, in a way, the first really intelligent human creature. We don't know why Cro-Magnon Man appeared. Uh, it had all happened in something like half a million years. We were apes, and then suddenly we started turning into human beings. Um, brain physiologists still talk about the brain explosion, and we still do not know why the brain explosion occurred. It happened with such speed, the, the speed with which we developed this top part of the brain, the ordinary cerebral hemispheres, you know, like the skin of an orange. And no one knows why. Why did it happen? Was there some sudden stimulus that so drove these primitive apes in a forward direction that they were forced, whether they liked it or not? to develop a far higher level of intelligence. There's no evidence whatsoever for that. All that we know is that for some weird reason, man exploded half a million years ago. Now, the odd thing about this explosion is that, of course, you know, some explosions, like atomic explosions, take place because they're ready to take place. Because the, there's a certain build-up and you get a chain reaction. This has always struck me as being the most probable explanation of the reason that we got the brain explosion in human beings. Of course, the next sort of major step was what we call Neanderthal man. And we now consider Neanderthal man to be a completely primitive ape-like creature whom, of whom we feel sort of slightly contemptible. Neanderthal woman, apparently, was an absolute slut as far as her kitchen was concerned. They find it piled high with skulls and bones and so on. And so the result was that if you look in H.G. Wells's Outline of History, you find all these pictures of Neanderthal man looking absolutely like a monkey, sort of crouched down with great brow ridges and so on. And yet we've now discovered that, in fact, Neanderthal man filled his tombs with flowers and also with sun disks and that he painted objects. And that in a sense, he was obviously deeply religious, which, you know, seems odd for an ape. <laughs> I mean, unless, you know, he was some kind of nut who thought that the lightning flashing was the god speaking to him or something of the sort, which doesn't seem very likely. I mean, horses aren't like that. Why should these ape-like creatures suddenly develop religion. The reason, I suppose, is, you know, as Jung says, that somehow the soul has a religious function, which is just as strong as its sexual function. And then, as you know, along came, Neander uh, along came cro magnon man, and apparently, as far as we know, exterminated Neanderthal man. Stan Gooch um, believes that this is not so, that what happened is that um, a Neanderthal man actually combined with Cro-Magnon man, and that um, the modern Jews are a descendant of Neanderthal man. I should mention that he himself is Jewish, so he's not being anti-Semitic. <laughs> he believes that this sort of curious uh, psychic ability, which he believes was that of Neanderthal man, has come down to the modern world. And that Cro-Magnon man was someone who was uh, far more concerned with the problems of everyday existence, which was the reason that he was far more factually successful. He was the earliest American, if you like. <laughs> but at the same time, um, by combining his abilities with those of Neanderthal man, we got this very peculiar balance, which has produced us. Most anthropologists do not agree with this. They think that Cro-Magnon man, our ancestor, exterminated Neanderthal man, wiped him out completely. And some around, sometime around about 40, 45,000 BC, Neanderthal man disappeared. And instead, you've got these Cro-Magnon men who, for the first time, made these cave paintings and apparently was an artist. We now know, of course, that the cave paintings were, in fact, magic. They were attempts by the Cro-Magnon shamans to persuade buffalo and all the rest of it um, to be available the next day for the Cro-Magnon hunters. And it's almost certain that they were. There's now very strong evidence that 
primitive tribes appear to have this ability to use a kind of magic. Uh, the simplest example being that one given uh, in a book called Pattern of Islands by Sir Arthur Grimble, who describes being in the Gilbert Islands and the calling of the porpoises. The shaman took himself into a little hut, stayed in there for three days. At the end of the three days came out and said, OK, they're coming. And suddenly, to the astonishment of Grimble, porpoises proceeded to swim into the beach in their thousands. And the Gilbert Islanders wandered into the water and battered them to death with clubs. The shaman had apologized in advance, apparently, to them, uh, to the porpoises. And um, that, was, um, that was that. Sh uh, he was never able to explain how the shaman was able to call the porpoises from the depths of the ocean. I'm convinced it's perfectly simple. We can all do this. We all have some peculiar power of the mind of which we're not normally aware. And also, since the 19th century, uh, when we've known about hypnosis, as you know, hypnosis uh, was first recognized by a couple of pupils of Anton Mesmer called Puiségur, around about the year 1815. Mesmer actually was not a hypnotist. All Mesmer did um, was to tie people to trees with the belief that the vital force of the tree would somehow flow into the people. And he also used magnets and so on and cure them of their illnesses. He was convinced that the world was full of a kind of vital fluid which can cure us, just like Wilhelm Reich, a century and a half later, with his orgone energy. Anyway, this kind of thing was an immense success in Paris for a brief period, and then the Paris doctors tossed him out. But his disciples, these two Puiségur brothers, tied a peasant called Victor Rass to a tree and began making these sort of passes that were supposed to make the energy of the tree flow through his body, when to their astonishment, Victor Rass went into a completely trance-like state. And they found that they could talk to him in this trance-like state and he would answer, but apparently not remember. When they told him to untie himself, he untied himself in the same peculiar trance-like way. The interesting thing was that he was able to read the mind of the Marquis de Puiségur, he was able to give him orders, purely mentally, and he would obey them. Now, this was something that was totally forgotten throughout the rest of the 19th century, until in the late 19th century, a doctor called Gibert in Le Havre discovered that he could do this with one of his patients. He merely had to touch a hand and by what he called peripheral muscular stimulation, send her straight into a trance. However, Unless he concentrated as he did it, it did not work. J.B. Priestley, when he was in New York at some literary festival in the 1960s, said to a friend of his, because he suddenly felt it happening inside him, I can make that woman wink at me. And he said he looked across the room at a woman who was obviously a non-winker <laughs> and concentrated like mad. And he said she suddenly turned to him and winked. Then she came up to him afterwards and said, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Priestley. I don't know why I did that. It was just a silly impulse. The answer was, of course, he'd willed her to do it. Now, I believe that basically all of these um, peculiar th phenomena are due to an ability we possess to project our wills or minds directly at the physical world and change things. Uh, last weekend, I was in the weekend before I was in um, New York State at a place called the Omega Institute and I got a phone call from an old friend of mine called Howard Miller whom I'd never met. He's a doctor who's mentioned in The Secret Life of Plants by Chris Bird and I first came across Howard years ago. Howard wrote me a letter in which he said that he was convinced that we possess some peculiar faculty which he called the unit of pure thought but you could really call it the controlling ego, the real you, which in certain moments of emergency or intensity takes over and can do things. And this immediately rang a bell. I felt this was tremendously important. In fact, it took some time for me to realize how important it was. But when I finally did recognize it, when it hit me one day, I wrote to him and said, do you realize you're the greatest psychologist since Freud? And I'm so convinced that this is true. Nobody in America knows about Miller, but he's very, very important. <laughs>
And so he came last weekend along to my class in Omega. And there are all kinds of things that I wanted to ask him. Um, and, you know, my students, I'd, I'd been telling them all morning about his theories, began to shoot these questions at him. And the first question was, how did you begin to get this idea that we have inside us this controlling ego which can actually control, you know, external events? And Howard said, well, when um, I was uh, a doctor, I had a patient who um, could not bear needles or anything of the sort, and she had a rotten tooth. And then one day, on television, I saw a hypnotist who was apparently able to send people into deep hypnosis, and he claimed that he could make them not feel pain. So I said, I rang him up, and I went to see this chap, and he was very obliging, and said, yes, he'd come along to the hypnotist. He said, the man with a huge turban on his head, and he was a little nervous and worried about the whole thing. But in fact, he said, the hypnotist said to his patient, um, okay, you're going to fall into a deep sleep and you will not feel any pain when your tooth is withdrawn. And he said that was precisely what happened. She went into a deep sleep and then to his astonishment, the hypnotist said, what's more, when your tooth is pulled out, you will not bleed. And Howard thought, no, that's absurd. You know, you, you can stop her from peeling, feeling pain, but you can't stop her from bleeding. In fact, when the tooth was pulled out, she did not bleed. Howard was very puzzled by this. They could see that hypnosis appears to involve some higher principle than we usually think of, you know, ordinary suggestion, because suggestion would work on your nervous system, but it wouldn't work on your body and stop you from bleeding. And he thought, well, in fact, the brain controls the hormone system, the thalamus and the pituitary, release certain things into your blood, which basically control your nervous system. But it appears that the cerebral cortex itself, which is a little bit on top, as I say, the orange skin, which is specifically human and which has developed in the past half million years, in fact, releases certain chemicals which control the pituitary and the thalamus. He came to the conclusion that in all probability, the answer to this problem of hypnosis came from the specifically human part of us, which you will agree sounds a bit absurd because we think of it as being something deeper, you know, D.H. Lawrence's solar plexus, Freud's unconscious and all that. Howard said, no, it's you. It's the ordinary conscious you. And he said that it suddenly struck him that this part of us was, you know, the essential control center. So one of my students said to him, well, what did you think happened when the hypnotist talked to this girl? And Howard said, to my astonishment, because this had never struck me before, Howard said, um, well, what happened was his mind influenced hers quite directly, just like Gibert, and just like Puiseguer and Victor Rass. I was astonished by this because I realized what he was saying. I'd been thinking just that morning, if you could take a leaf off a tree and stare at it and make it go brown in spots by just concentrating on it, you would realize that you had something inside your head that could do things in the same way that your hand can do things when you order them to. And the thing is, we do not know this, but it's true. And it's our most important faculty. And when we know it, we shall advance to the next stage of our evolution. We shall use it as naturally as our hands. Now, Howard said that it struck him that we are like a person sitting in a cinema watching a film which is upside down and which keeps sort of jerking and so on. And you think, my God, what's gone wrong with a projectionist? And you go up to the projection box and it's empty. And then suddenly you remember you are the projectionist. But in a certain sense, we are supposed to be doing this. And then he went on to say, an example I'd already found in his work, he said, look, close your eyes. Imagine that you were on a hot beach on a sort of marvelously warm day. You can hear the sighing of the sea. You can feel the sand through your toes. He said, OK, now change it. You're on a freezing cold mountainside on a winter day, the pine trees are loaded up with snow, and you feel this cold wind almost freezing your cheekbones. He said, 
What in you made that change? Like a TV changer pushing one button and another. He said, you don't do it because you don't recognize it because you do it so naturally and easily. When you do this with your hand, you don't say, what in me did that? Because, you know, your hand closes of its own accord. He said, there's this thing inside you which is basically freedom and which we do not recognize we possess and which Gibert and the Puiseguers did begin to recognize because they could see its effect upon other people. Howard said, in fact, we're capable of exercising this, what you might call, influence, quite directly, mind to mind. Do you remember William James had a nervous breakdown? I've quoted this in The Outsider, it's always fascinated me. He said that at a time of extreme discouragement, he went into a room at twilight, and suddenly there flashed into his mind, in this state of sort of lowness, the image of a catatonic patient in a nearby mental home that he'd seen a few days before with a kind of green face and his arms folded like an Egyptian image staring blankly ahead of him with completely black eyes obviously feeling that life was so futile that he wanted to do nothing whatever and James said it suddenly hit him my God there but for the grace of God go I if the hour should strike for me as it struck for him, nothing could save me from his fate. And he said it hit him with such force that there was something collapsed inside him. In other words, the air went out of the tire and he got a flat tire. And he said that suddenly, from then on, he had an appalling sense of the total meaninglessness of human existence. He said he would wake up in the morning with his strange doubt and misery in the pit of his stomach and he was very intrigued by his mother a sort of jolly easy-going person who didn't seem to recognize how completely unreal and chancy human existence is he said you know she was like somebody walking along a high wall with a steep drop on either side of her not recognizing it now apparently this went on for quite some time until he came across a definition of free will by the French philosopher Charles Renouvier. And what Renouvier said was, I possess free will because I can think of one thing rather than another. Now, you can say that almost any physical thing you do is motivated by stimulus and response. But if you think of it, you can decide to think of one thing and then change the direction of your, your thought instantaneously. This was enough to suddenly make James say, yes, of course, I contain free will. It's so subtle and so difficult to see that you can't see it like a candle in the sunlight. And yet it's the realest thing in us. And if we do not recognize its existence, then we tend to go around in an intellectual state, and I underline that word, of negativity. And when you're in an intellectual state of negativity and you're 50-50, 50% robot and 50% real you, and some discouragement comes along, you let yourself sink to 49% robot because you do not feel you possess freedom. Whereas you notice that when you get interested and excited, when suddenly things begin to go right, you get this odd certainty that things are okay. You know it somehow inside you that it's okay. It's going to be all right. And it always is. Somehow you've activated something inside you which changes things in the external world. This is what, of course, Jung meant by synchronicity. In some odd way, we can alter the external world by getting in peculiar states of intensity and excitement. This is what Howard Miller had basically recognized. It's almost as if you were trying to drive a car sitting in the passenger seat and leaning across to the steering wheel and trying to put your feet across to the pedals. Then any emergency occurs, you suddenly leap with a shriek 
into the passenger seat and suddenly it's all much easier. This is a, what appears to happen in these moments of great intensity. You suddenly just switch from one to the other. And suddenly you are in charge. And you can see that the difference is simply the difference in knowing that you possess freedom. You know, think of it. Uh, something nice happens in the morning. You receive a check you hadn't expected, you know, something nice happens. For the rest of the day, you have this sort of curious feeling of, you know, being lucky. That kind of <laughs> under, <laughs> underwater glow inside you, as if you kind of switched on lights below the threshold of consciousness, pink lights, and everything is fine. And yet, you know, your life is exactly the same as it is normally. Now, this is what had always fascinated me. Because whenever, like Hans Keller, we face some emergency that threatens our existence, it's at these points that quite suddenly we recognize that if only the emergency would go away, life would be ecstatic. <laughs> and we can see this again and again and again. In other words, the condition in which you and I and now existing is a condition of ecstasy. If in fact we were suddenly aroused to a sense of crisis by some real problem, we would think, oh my God, if only the problem would go away and leave us at that, in that in ecstatic, wonderfully relaxed condition we were last night in the Unitarian Church. Life would be wonderful. Well, we're in it. All the time. The only problem is that the robot is 51%. And so we don't recognize we're in it. All we have to do is galvanize ourselves that 1%. You know, my favorite story, which you've all heard every time, about Graham Greene playing Russian roulette getting into a state of absolute boredom and misery and depression, finding a gun, taking it out on the Berkhamsted Common and playing Russian roulette with one bullet. And as he pulls the trigger, there's a click. And he looks down and sees that the bullet has now come into position and experiences this overwhelming sense of sheer delight and happiness. The sudden feeling that life is infinitely rich and exciting. And quite clearly, all that has happened is that these vital forces, which you simply allowed to go into, as it were, a soggy condition, have been pulled together by this mental effort. Now you can see that Graham Greene was sort of in a 46% real green and sort of 54% robot. That was the reason that it was a difficult thing to do. But you see, we're not. All of you here, sitting here, are 50% real you and 50% robot. You've only got to get one more percent and you're in the peak experience. <laughs> so we're very close to this borderline all the time, all human beings. You see, human history appears to have been a series of pendulum swings between this recognition that suddenly there's something very exciting happening and the feeling, you see, that it's all boring. And in fact, the one of the first persons to realize what was really going on was this extremely interesting American called Julian James, who, you know, his book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, it still strikes me as one of the most important books published in the last half, last half century, and too few people know about it. You remember, what James said was that one day he was lying on a settee worrying about some um, academic problem when suddenly he heard a voice talking out of the air above his head, saying, include the knower in the known. And he said he leapt off the settee, searched under the settee, looked behind the curtains and found nobody there, and thought, oh my God, I'm going mad. And was very worried until he learned that from a doctor that most people that have had auditory hallucinations, that at least 10% of people have had them fairly regularly regularly, and also Russians apparently have them 25% of the time. <laughs> and uh, this cheered him up greatly, and he began looking into this whole problem. 
of auditory hallucinations. Now, what then struck him when he began to read the Iliad and the Bible and various other ancient texts was that these people were always hearing the voices of the gods talking to them. He suddenly thought, my God, it's the same thing. Then suddenly he got a very weird idea. He thought, animals seem not to have what you might call an eye. They don't seem to be able to introspect in any way. Uh, it seems that, in a sense, they're more or less mechanical creatures. And, you know, many human beings are this way. Sartre, if you remember, said in La Noce about the cafe proprietor, when his cafe empties, his head empties too. And many human beings appear to work on this stimulus response principle. Now, Jane suddenly thought, is it possible that ancient man did not have an eye? In other words, when we wish to solve a problem, like, you know, supposing you're just deciding whether to travel back from here by bus or train or whatever, you envisage traveling by bus, you're traveling by train, you have these two images in your head and you compare them in your head and you decide which is desirable. You can retreat inside yourself and ask that question because in a sense the you inside you is a friend, is somebody you know, you've known ever since you were young. What James is saying is that the heroes of the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Old Testament had no you inside them. If you could get behind their eyes you would have found a blank now, he says that, that seems to be a weird proposition. You know, surely, we've all got to have a you inside us. Until he said, you think of someone playing the piano brilliantly. In fact, what they're doing is playing it, in a sense, mechanically. If they allow their minds to interfere with what they're doing, they screw themselves up completely. The you has to keep out of it. And that this even appears for thinking. You know, we think that thinking is a conscious activity. But in fact, if you picked up two similar objects, like a pen and a pencil, closed your eyes, you would feel them with your fingers and feel, yes, you know, one's got a sort of thing to stick it on your pocket and the other hasn't, and so on. And you would be thinking. And then if you in operation, the brain's dead. I mean, it can't feel anything. It's anesthetized. He found that accidentally poking an electric probe around in the brain, he got the most extraordinary results, um, particularly in the temporal cortex. Now, when he stimulated the area of the brain um, called Wernicke's area, um, here at the back, which is again the specific human area connected with speech, but he stimulated the right side of the brain, which is the instinctive side rather than the conscious side, people heard voices, mysterious voices, suddenly talked to them. That convinced him that what was happening was that ancient man did not have the ability we possess to a minor extent to work things out in his own head. According to Jacques Derrida, we hardly possess this at all. All our thinking is time conditioned, past conditioned. I think he's a fucking cunt, I must say. But this is something I would like to go into later. <laughs> All our thinking is time conditioned and to some extent we therefore need something else besides what you would call freedom for making decisions. This something, according to James, are voices from the other you. In other words, we are such complex organizations that we can't afford to be a unity in which you give the orders and make the decisions. It has to come from somewhere else. Now, of course, this was exactly what Freud said. Freud had studied in Paris under Charcot in the 1880s and been deeply impressed by Charcot's experiments in hypnosis. Charcot was the first one who dared to do experiments in hypnosis after this tremendous slump in the fortunes of hypnosis since Mesmer. And of course, he did these astonishing demonstrations in which his patients would flap their arms and think they were birds, or crawl on the ground and bark like dogs, or in which a man could be told he was about to be touched with a red-hot iron and would produce a blister. 
or in which a woman who believed she was pregnant would swell up. Freud could see there was something very odd going on, that the ordinary conscious mind is by no means the controller. And of course he produced the whole sexual theory of the unconscious, and you know, we must give Freud credit for this. He was the first person to recognize the existence of the unconscious. Unfortunately, he believed that the fact that there is this enormous force inside us which gives the orders means that we are the puppets of this force. And then it pulls the strings and we dance. What Howard Miller was saying was, no, the captain of a ship is much smaller than the ship up there on the bridge, but he decides which way the ship goes. The driver of an elephant sitting up there on its head in India is much smaller than the elephant, but he gives the orders. At the end of his life, Jung was asked, don't you feel you've attached too much importance to the unconscious mind? And Jung said, no, of course not. I've always believed that the conscious is the most important factor of all. Absolute liar. But the fact is that towards the end of his life, he had recognized, as Howard Miller did, that the ordinary conscious mind is the answer. We do not recognize the extent to which the ordinary conscious mind controls the unconscious. That was the whole point of Jung's idea of so-called active imagination. It was simply the recognition that if you begin to interfere in a subtle way with your unconscious mind, it would do what you tell it. Rambo, in the 1890s, had talked about deliberate delusions, hallucinations, um, seeing angels playing drums and coaches at the bottom of a lake and all the rest of it. Jung suddenly proved that it was possible. You know, um, in the 1880s, you had this character here in America called Thompson J. Hudson, who became fascinated by hypnosis because he saw a demonstration by a Professor Carpenter in Boston who placed a young man under deep hypnosis. He was a fairly stupid young man, and Carpenter said to him, um, now you're under hypnosis, I'm going to introduce you to Socrates. And the young man said, but surely Socrates is dead. And Carpenter said, yes, but I'm able to revive his ghost. He then said, this is Socrates. And the young man said, oh, my God, how do you do, sir? And shook hands most solemnly. And then Carpenter said, by the way, we can't hear what Socrates is saying. Would you um, interpret for us? Thereupon, a dialogue ensued between the young man and Socrates that was absolutely brilliant. And everyone st sat there with their mouths open. And at the end of all this, Carpenter said, OK, now I wish to introduce you to Immanuel Kant. The young man obviously didn't know as much about Kant as he'd known about Socrates. The dialogue that ensued was once again quite brilliant, but it had nothing whatsoever to do with Kant's philosophy. <laughs> and then Carpenter took this young man through a whole series of philosophers. And he said that the dialogues were so incredible that they could have been printed as a sort of system of the universe. And many people in the hall thought, well, maybe these philosophers have really appeared from the dead. And so just to disprove this, Carpenter introduced the ghost of a philosophic pig, which discoursed on Hinduism most learnedly. Now, Hudson was deeply struck by this. He could see something very odd was going on. And that what was happening was that we possess some deep force inside us which is capable of immense creativity if it can be left to itself. He then got to know a painter who was able to look at a blank canvas and see a whole picture on it. And all he had to do was fill in <laughs> with the paints and the charcoal. And from then on, Hudson was completely convinced we possessed two people inside us. One, he said, copes with the external world, and that he called the objective mind. The other one turns inwards to your internal world, and this he called the subjective mind. And he said the subjective mind possesses immense power, and that is what gets taken over by the hypnotist and does all these incredible things. In other words, if we could all liberate our subjective minds, we'd all be men of genius. Not only that, we'd be capable of producing miracles, because he believed that Jesus was simply a person who had been able to liberate his subjective mind, or rather, in whom the subjective and the objective mind were so close together, 
that one was able to communicate quite directly to the other, whereas in the rest of us there's a kind of gap between them. Now, Hudson went on to demonstrate this more or less. He said, well, if Jesus can do miracles, so can I. And so, what he decided to do was try and cure some relative who was in the middle of Ohio of gout. The man was completely confined to his wheelchair. And he told several people in advance, look, I'm going to do this. And he found that the best time to do this was on the point of sleep in the evening. He said, when you're just falling asleep, this is the time when the powers of the subjective mind are at their most powerful. So when you're on the verge of sleep, if you badly want something, try to concentrate your subjective powers upon what you want. He also said when you're first waking up in the morning, try to do it. Well, he did this for a couple of months. They met somebody from Ohio and said, how's my uncle getting on? And they said, incredible! He's sort of no longer in his wheelchair and he's bouncing around like a spring lamb. And since he placed all this on record, he was absolutely certain. The dates corresponded. You know, he'd started the experiments on the 28th of March, and by the 30th of March, his uncle was already feeling much better. So he claims in his book, the most important book, I think, you know, in America in the late 19th century, it's called The Law of Psychic Phenomena by Thompson J. Hudson. And it's still one of the most important books ever written. He claims that he was able to do this, I think he says, to a thousand people, get about approximately a thousand results of the same sort. He says, incidentally, that when uh, the person knew he was going to do it, it didn't work. <coughs> Worked far better, in other words, if he did it directly. And you can see what happens. The person puts up a sort of shield. The same kind of thing happened in London um, in the 1960s. A man called Mason in a hospital got a patient in with what is called fish skin disease, um, something like ichthyosis, which means your skin is covered with a horrible looking crust. He tried to cure him by hypnosis and it worked amazingly well. And then one of his colleagues, seeing these results, that you know, the patient's arms now no longer had this horrible scale, scale looking like a dinosaur, but you know, ordinary pink flesh, and said, have you looked up ichthyosis in a medical encyclopedia? And he said, no. He said, well, try it. When he looked it up, he realized that this is a genetic condition due to the fact that your skin has no oil-producing glands. It would have been impossible to cure by hypnosis. And as soon as he knew this, it no longer worked. <laughs> and what's more, when the patient later found out about it, it was even worse because, you know, the experiments just evaporated into total frustration. As soon as the conscious mind began getting in there and doubting, it didn't work. So what Hudson was really saying was that this deep part of us, which you can see is Howard Miller's unit of pure thought, was the thing that really took over. Somebody, one of my students said to him, yeah, but why did you call it the unit of pure thought? Why not, you know, the controlling ego? Or something of the sort. And Howard said, well, you're misunderstanding me. He said, by thought... I don't mean, you know, the things you think. I mean, what does the thinking? The, the something behind thinking. He said, and it seems to me that we're dealing with something behind thinking in the universe itself. The, in other words, the TV changer in the universe. He said, and we're just units of that. So we're units of pure thought. And my student said, um, you mean God? And he said, oh, for God's sake, let's not drag these names in. We, we're trying to be scientific. And I could suddenly see why he was so worried about this. What he had stumbled on is surely a fundamental scientific insight. It's nothing to do with religion or mysticism. Another friend of mine, when I started writing The Occult in the late 1960s, a man called David Foster, um, sent me some of his papers, and he was a cybernetician. And one of his chief papers was about cybernetics, which, as you know, is the science of control, um, controlling processes by... Um, computers. So that the simplest cybernetic process, for example, is um, a lavatory system which cuts off when the water gets high enough to make the ball cut off the flow of water. That's a cybernetic system. And um, he said, whenever you look at something like an acorn, you can see that this is, in fact, a piece of cybernetic programming for an oak tree. So exactly the same. When um, 
when washing machines first came out in England, we had a sort of plastic biscuit you stuck in the, a slot in the washing machine with various programs around its edges to make it, you know, wash or dry or blow hot air or whatever. And he said that an acorn is precisely such a plastic biscuit. And you stick it in the earth and it produces an oak tree. He said the only odd thing was that as a cybernetician studying all this, he could see that there are no forces on earth powerful enough to program such a biscuit as an acorn. He said one of the basic laws of cybernetics is that blue light can be a program for red light because it has a higher frequency, but red light can't be a program for blue light. In other words, um, you can drive your car because your mind moves faster than your car. But if you're so drunk or tired that your mind moves slower than your car, you're likely to have a smash. Your mind must move faster than the car. That's the basic cybernetic principle. And he said there are no energies on Earth which in a purely ordinary physical sense are high enough to program an acorn. He said the only things that could program it are cosmic rays, for example. They have enough actual high frequency, enough force. So I, I put this in the beginning of the occult, and he went on to write a book called The Intelligent Universe. But he also is not interested in God. He says it appears to indicate that there's something which is interfering in human existence, which is intelligent. But, you know, we shouldn't sort of start talking about God or anything of the sort. All we know is that this is a fact, and let's stick to the fact. Never mind what it indicates. And, you know, I sympathize deeply with this. What it appears to indicate <laughs> is that in some strange way, the mind is capable of influencing physical reality. And we don't believe this. We don't accept it as normal. We feel we are the puppets of physical reality. And particularly when you get tired, you feel that you're very much a puppet of physical reality. But, you see, the basic insight of Jung from the beginning was that the mind is capable of influencing physical reality. This is the reason that he disliked Freud's whole sexual theory. Because Freud's sexual theory is fundamentally mechanistic. It turns the mind into a kind of machine which is operated by, you know, sexual neurosis, sexual pressures coming from underneath. Whereas what, what Jung had felt from the very beginning is that as soon as you introduce into the life of a patient anything that suddenly stimulates them to a higher state of will, then suddenly the neurosis disappeared. Do you remember the famous case of Abraham Maslow, in which the young girl who came to him suffering from a feeling of absolute total boredom, so that she'd even cease to menstruate, complained that she was feeling absolutely run down. And instead of finding out whether she wanted to murder her mother and sleep with her father, he said, OK, tell me about your present existence. And what she said was that she was a good student of sociology. Um, she had, at the period of the uh, financial collapse in 1929 to 31, been the only member of her family capable of getting a good job. And she had supported the rest of her family, who were all out of work, brothers and her father. She'd worked as the personnel manageress in the chewing gum factory, and it bored her sick. And because she'd become increasingly bored, she'd become more and more robotic, and when you were robotic, you no longer recharge your vital batteries because the robot doesn't recharge. So you get flatter and flatter and flatter like a car left in the garage all winter. Maslow said to her, why don't you go to night school and do sociology? As soon as she did that, all the symptoms cleared up. As soon as she began doing something with interest, she proceeded to pour electricity back into the battery, the batteries recharged and everything was fine. So, we appear to have this basic drive inside us, and if we recognize that it exists, everything is fine. And of course, when you're happy, when you're in a cheerful state of mind, you, you know it exists because you feel it. When you, you know, sort of, you're tired, and at the end of a day's work, you sort of have a martini or something of the sort. Or, you know, if you're sitting outside a cafe watching people wandering by on the pavement and suddenly having an interesting conversation, you get this odd feeling of a, a trickling flow of 
interest. That the world is in itself interesting. And that interest causes you to somehow kind of perk up inside. And the perking up makes the world in itself more interesting. And suddenly you catch a glimpse of this basic truth that if you could do this all the time, you'd stay on that high level of intensity. You would never collapse into the state of discouragement, which appears to be the fairly normal state of human existence. This, you see, is my vision. This is the thing that's the center of all my work. I've seen this from the beginning. All my work has been about this. You know, in The Outsider, I wrote about Hermann Hesse's Steppenwolf, who, like my hero in Ritual in the Dark, has a nice little room, gramophone record, books. He ought to be ideally happy because he, he can devote his existence to the life of the mind. Instead, he's bored stiff. He spends his days struggling to get interested in, you know, books and ideas, and somehow it just won't spark. And then he goes along to a cafe one evening after a day in which he's even contemplated suicide and has a glass of cold Moselle, and he said, suddenly a fragment of Mozart floats into his head like a fragment of heaven. And suddenly he said, the golden bubble burst, and I was aware of Mozart and the stars. And suddenly, whoosh, and that total feeling of optimism and happiness that fascinates me so much. But you see, there's something very interesting about this condition of Mozart and the stars. You see, if you think of it, nearly all your normal feelings of happiness are due to the future. Something nice is going to happen tomorrow. Or, you know, you've been worried and suddenly, as I say, you receive a check or something happens and you have this feeling, of, oh good, thank God for that. It's all to do with time, the future. We cannot think in a certain sense of happiness which is not connected with the future. And yet you can see that there's nothing to do with the future in that state. What Schepenwolf was saying is, I'm intensely happy. Why? Because Mozart existed. It's preposterous. It's nothing to do with the future. You're moving, so to speak, sideways in time instead of forwards. Your happiness is due to what you have here at this moment and what already exists in the world. Do you realize that if Martians could come here, they would say, my God, those human beings are the most ecstatically happy creatures we've ever seen. Their achievement is extraordinary. Over centuries, they've produced this magnificent civilization. They've conquered more than any other species in the galaxy. They're in a superb position. And he'd add, mind, the odd thing is, they're all sort of unhappy and suicidal. We don't really understand why. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this recognition that we are moving, so to speak, in a different direction? You see, this is a story that I've told you before. But this business of Graham Greene playing Russian roulette and suddenly experiencing an intense, overwhelming feeling of ecstasy as there was just a click and he realized he hadn't blown out his brains. You can see that all he did was use the unit of pure thought, the television changer, to suddenly recharge himself instantaneously. That's obviously what we're all about. If we could develop this faculty of recharging ourselves instantaneously, we'd have it. You see, what we want are states of what you might call all systems go consciousness. Like a car at its ideal speed when the engine is perfectly heated up and there are just no problems, it's going perfectly. This is what we're after. This is the Mozart and the Stars stage. Um, actually, there's a very interesting modern philosopher called Jean Gebser, a Swiss philosopher, written about by this George Feuerstein who seems to be very significant. One of Gebser's points about consciousness, all his works and analysis of consciousness, is that there are certain states which he calls integral consciousness, in which you are totally, happily satisfied with the present moment. 
in fact you glow in the present moment. You have no feelings of need or desire, you suddenly recognize how superb the present moment is. Mozart and the stars. The ideal example is in a novel called From Here to Eternity by James Jones. There's a scene in which Pruitt, the soldier, is sitting there in the PX having a glass of cider and he's in a very difficult um, uh, condition because th they're trying to force him to become a boxer and he doesn't want to become a boxer and they're being absolutely bloody to him and making his life a total misery. And yet as he sits there drinking the glass of cider and looking around at the other soldiers, he thinks, my God, I love being a soldier. That's integral consciousness, just sudden acceptance of your present state. That's what happened when Graham Greene pointed the gun at his head and pulled the trigger. And it is what would happen to everybody if suddenly a serious crisis appeared and made you see that your present moment is ecstatically happy. A friend of mine, Margaret Lane, and this is the story I started to tell, told me that um, she stopped writing novels for a long time because she'd had a kind of nervous breakdown. And she then went on to describe this event, which was that she'd had a baby and she was extremely tired after she had the baby. She felt completely, totally exhausted. And yet, in this state of exhaustion, she was also immensely happy because she had a feeling of universal harmony and happiness. The only trouble with this wide open condition of happiness was that if anything went slightly wrong, it struck her as an absolute tragedy so that when the cat caught its paw in the door, she burst into tears. Well, she said she was in this condition when she got that edition of the New Yorker that contained John Hersey's account of the dropping of the first atom bomb on Hiroshima. They devoted a whole issue to it. And she said in this wide open condition, it absolutely shattered her. It blew all her mental fuses. It seemed so incredibly horrible that she felt, my God, I don't want to be a human being. And she said she experienced the same inner total collapse that William James experienced in his dressing room at twilight. She said this state made her for the next few years see life as absolutely flat and dead. She felt nothing whatever. But as she was a wife and a mother, she had to keep going. She couldn't let herself collapse into a soggy state of misery and despair, so she kept forcing herself onwards. And she said that after um, a couple of years, she and her husband decided to rent a cottage in Hampshire. They went along, and she said, by the way, one of the symptoms of this condition was that blast or grass always looked as if it was cut out of blue paper, and leaves always looked as if they were cut out of green tin, which is apparently one of the symptoms of paranoia. And as she was walking up the back garden, she says, as usual, the grass looked as if it was cut out of blue paper, the leaves looked as if they were cut out of green tin. And she said, suddenly she saw the first bluebell that she'd seen that year. And she stopped to stare at it, and as she focused her attention and thought, my God, isn't that lovely? For the first time in two or three years, she suddenly experienced a curious feeling of sheer happiness. And she said she suddenly burst into floods of tears as the grass turned into normal grass and the leaves turned into normal leaves. And she said over the next two or three days, like ice breaking on a river in spring, everything went back to normal. In other words, she got herself out of a sort of low, miserable, depressed state into her normal state and she stayed there. Now Graham Greene is obviously, if you've read any of his books, normally in a low, miserable state in which he feels that life is an endless betrayal. He experienced the sudden sense of extreme delight when he pulled the trigger and he's experienced it several times in the course of his life. He says that in Africa, when he was in extreme danger, he said, I discovered in myself something I'd never suspected, a love of life. <laughs> but obviously, he didn't register it intellectually. He didn't grasp it and say, yes, that is true. Like one plus one equals two. We're talking about mathematics here. We're not talking about mysticism or religion. We're talking about something absolutely solid and down to earth and scientific. Grasp it with the intellect. Grasp what we're talking about. Grasp that your mind already has the power to do it. 
and quite suddenly everything is transformed. You see, I've only started to really grasp this myself after talking about it since 1956. I'm beginning to see for the first time with great clarity exactly what it means. You know, last autumn I experienced enlightenment. I, you know, I, I didn't really believe it. I was thinking about this and suddenly, boing, it happened. And I realized I'd been enlightened. You know, like the Buddha and all these other characters. <laughs> I thought, you know, is, is this real or is it just a feeling? And I looked at it and I examined it and I thought, no, it's real, all right, it's enlightenment. I can't get it back easily, but I know the way um, to get it back because, you see, what I saw is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, the flash that came to me, I tried to capture as I got it, and in fact, you know, I've been spreading it out over this evening in a certain sense, because in order to put it into words, it spreads in time. Whereas when you see it, it comes like that in a single flash. But what I saw was absolutely perfectly simple. Um, a novelist called L. H. Myers wrote, an, wrote a novel called The Near and the Far in the 1920s, which starts off with the young Prince Jarley, who's travelled across the desert for days with his father to attend some great concourse of Akbar, the great mogul, standing on the battlements of the castle of Akbar, looking out over the desert at a magnificent sunset and feeling there are two sunsets, one of which is a glory to the eye and another of which is a weariness to the foot. And that there's no way of bringing together those two, the magic of the horizon. That was what killed all of those 19th century romantics, the feeling there was no way of hanging on to that strange magic that you get when your mind is projected into the distance. You know, he said if you rushed downstairs and rushed across the desert, you wouldn't get anywhere near it, you'd just get your shoes full of sand. And that therefore the near and the far are absolutely irreconcilable. Now you see, in forensic medicine, there's a thing called a comparison microscope, which is used for comparing bullets. If you take a bullet out, a bullet out of a corpse, and you wish to find out whether a, a gun fired that bullet, you fire another bullet from the gun, you put them under the comparative microscope, which has two eyes, then you turn a little wheel at the side, and the two bullets blend together. And you see whether the grooves in one compare exactly to the grooves in the other. You've got one bullet that brought the near and the far together. You see, whenever we experience moments of great intensity, we say, of course! And then afterward we say, of course what? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, our problem is extremely simple. It's this bringing of the near and the far together. And the best example I can give you, this is a sexual one, the, the Marquis de Sade wrote a novel called Eugénie de Franval, one of his early works, which is about a father who seduces his daughter. And as I read this thing, you know, the father sort of telling his daughter at the age of 16 that he's brought her up to be his mistress and so on, I found myself sort of rather puzzled by this as I do when I read that Jung needed a series of mistresses. It seems, you know, to me an odd paradox of human consciousness that you should be in this condition where you need continual change, um, continual forbiddenness. And uh, it struck me, you see, the problem with sex is a very simple one. When you fall in love, you're registering an immense spark gap between you and the person you desire. That there's a difference which is real. And that the problem is that when you're in bed in the dark, somehow that difference disappears, consciousness falls into the agnomicla paradox, ugh, and suddenly the bodies are together and all potential has, as it, you know, electrical potential has equalized between the two. And what the Marquis de Sade was trying to do by saying, okay, here's this wicked de Franval who's making love to his daughter, is feeling, you know, aren't I wicked? That's my daughter. They're in the dark, they're in bed. But he's establishing a difference between her and himself. So that although they're in the dark, there's a difference 
And that's the essential thing we're talking about. You see, the main problem of human consciousness is what you might call ambiguity. This tendency to want something, and then when you start to get it, not to be sure whether you wanted it or not. That sort of strange feeling of, you know, did I really want it? And this, it seems to me, is the basic problem of human existence. We want things with great clarity, and if somebody actually put a gun to your head, you would know that you wanted to be alive above everything else. And yet, as soon as we begin to get what we want, you know, and some people spend their lives striving for things they want, they dissolve away into this peculiar ambiguity. Did I really want it, you know? Jung had a case of a patient, which he describes um, in the um, Psychology of the Unconscious, he says that the man had been a brilliant businessman. Um, he'd achieved everything he wanted to achieve, and at a certain point, he suddenly felt, well, I may as well retire. And as soon as he retired, ugh, everything went. And when he went to Jung a couple of years later, he was a, in a condition of total moral collapse. Now, you can see there is a, an example of ambiguity for you. And Jung, of course, interpreted this in his times in terms of the archetypes of the collective unconscious and all the rest of this rubbish, which has nothing whatsoever to do with real human psychology, and um, failed to cure the man. He said, you know, I realize nothing could cure him but death. <laughs> but in point of fact, you can see all that had happened is this situation we've been talking about. You want something badly. You know with no doubt whatsoever that this is a real value and you want it. Now, what's wrong with us then? That when we start to get it, the mind goes, Ugh, and relaxes and you only half want it, as in the Agnomikla paradox. You can see the problem. It's like a baby whose fist is not yet capable of grabbing some shining object you swing above his cradle. He sort of makes the attempt but his hands won't close on the object, simply because he's a baby. Our minds at this point in evolution are not capable of closing and gripping. So we want something, we want it badly and provided we can continue to see it receding slightly from us and not be sure we're going to get it, we maintain that inner intensity and mental pressure. But if you I suddenly feel, okay, good, Everything's okay, I've got it. Quite suddenly, quite automatically, you let out your inner pressure and you go half flat like a tire with a leak. This is us, our only problem at this point in evolution. You see, it's a preposterously simple problem. All we have to do is to maintain that higher pressure. I set out when I came to America this time to see whether I could do it. Whether, talking again and again and again about the same basic subject... I could get myself into a state of high pressure and not feel after a lecture whew, and let go because that's the problem. What's more, when I got back to England in um, the beginning of October, I've got to work even harder than I've worked here. I'm working for two magazines simultaneously. I've got to do a novel. I've got to work with my son on the second volume of an encyclopedia of unsolved mysteries. I've got to do, go to London and do the first of a series of half-hour television programs. I've got to go to the Cheltenham Festival and lecture. I've got to give a full weekend seminar in London at the end of October. And I've got to launch a book about myself at the beginning of November. I can't let up. <laughs> now, when in 1973 I had a similar series of, you know, events that really were putting pressure on me, I went, oh. Actually, what happened was that two Canadian journalists came to interview me, and they talked and talked and talked and talked until I was absolutely bored and sick. And that's the sure way to go, Ugh. <laughs> And in the middle of the night, I was working very well, very hard at the time, tremendously hard, harder than I've ever worked in my life. But the fact is, it was those journalists making me go, Ugh who caused me to go flat. And suddenly I had went into a series of panic attacks in which the whole world seemed completely pointless and boring. And for months afterwards, like William James, I woke every morning with that feeling of total despair dragging down at the pit of my stomach. The feeling that life is fundamentally meaningless. Now, what you've got to recognize is that we all experience this on average once a day. It's sort of, you know, a fairly normal human condition. And it shouldn't be 
There's no earthly reason why it should be. All we have to do is recognize the basis of the problem. And then, as I say, when you know how to solve it, it's like knowing the binomial theorem for solving quadratic equations. The quadratic equation may look very difficult, but with the binomial theorem, you just go ahead and solve it. Human beings are on the point of knowing the binomial theorem of consciousness. And if I can actually prove that this can be done, I mean, you know, if you hear when I get back to London I've been killed in an accident or I've died of cancer or something of the sort, you'll say, ha-ha, Wilson was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a feeling that I'm a test case and that, you know, it is possible to do it because, after all, all my life has been an attempt to focus these insights and if I die now, with the insights, as it were, still unrealized, I should have done exactly as all those romantics of the 19th century did. I should have been an unsuccessful experiment. What I would like to be is the first really successful experiment in the modern age, because that's what it's all about. This has been going on now for something like 4,000 years, since the days of Cro-Magnon Man, we've been steadily de developing this sudden sense that life is potentially extremely deeply interesting. Then we've been losing it, like a child whose memory is too bad to hold on to the reason he went into a room to look for something. And you must agree, we order this every day. All we have to do is to develop that extra grasp, so to speak, and hold on to it. I even find lecturing like this, you see, is a problem for me because I've got so much to say that I could keep you here for five hours and still, in a sense, not get through what I've got to say. I'm looking down on it kind of from a height and it's like a great big circle. And I can see the center of the circle. What I'm actually doing is crisscrossing it like this from side to side. I'm not doing it in an organized sort of way. I'm seeing it in a kind of bird's eye view. And this is what human existence is all about. In the moments of intensity, we see things in a single flash. That, by the way, is what Derrida totally denies. He says all knowledge is time-conditioned, therefore you never see anything in a total flash. It always comes from the past and builds up from the past. It doesn't. William James said that he'd had a number of mystical experiences, and in each one he'd seen the same thing. But one thing reminded him of something else, and that reminded him of something else, and that reminded him of something else, and that reminded him of something else. And he said, like a flash of lightning, zigzagging out to some distant horizon, so fast that language could not keep up with it. He had this immense view of distant horizons of fact. This is what we are capable of. We are being dragged down to earth, so to speak, by an enormous gravity a sort of gravitational force which prevents our minds from achieving all systems go states, integral consciousness states. I once said, writing about Gurdjieff, that human beings are like grandfather clocks driven by watch springs. And yet, it's not quite true. We're more like water mills driven by a trickle of muddy water when we ourselves control the flow of the water. And in the moments of intensity, in the moments of integral consciousness, there's a roaring flood, and suddenly the mill is working at its normal capacity. And we know that this is normal, not subnormal. And as soon as you glimpse this possibility, you suddenly recognize that we are on the point of taking charge of our lives. Jung said that when he was 13, he had his first mystical experience. And that what the mystical experience amounted to was that on his way to school, he suddenly had the feeling, I am myself. He said up until then, he could look back on the past, and it was a sort of grey wall of fog, in which he felt that other factors controlled him. And <laughs> now suddenly he had this odd feeling, no, now I am me. This happens in every moment of intensity. And what I'm telling you is that it's simply a matter of 
make that extra effort and get that extra 1% and suddenly you are 51% real you. Moreover, if you can control the robot to the extent of realizing that there is no earthly reason why one day we should not all be 60% real you and only 40% robot, this would really be the great changing point in our evolution. But even now, just having the recognition that we're so close to that 51-49% should be enough. It can be done. I'm absolutely convinced. Even now, you see, the changes that have taken place in my lifetime since The Outsider came out in 1956, at which time all America was sort of basically left-wing. You know, sort of all the intelligent young people, and the same thing went in England. If I, when I talked about these kind of things then, people accused me of being a Nazi, believe it or not. Because they said, why aren't you interested you know, in communal things? In what will make us all happy? Why are you so interested in the individual? You can see that the only way of going forward is being interested in the individual. Because when all individuals are going forward together, then, at last, we shall have a decent sort of universe. And all this has happened in the course of my lifetime from 1956 until now. This sort of enormous change. So that actually, I can feel, you know, that I'm talking to you. But there's this communication. You know, on Sunday morning at Esalen, I was feeling lousy. I got this cold when I left Omega in New York. And by Sunday, my chest would hardly work. And when I went into my class, I'd sort of drunk two pints of boiling hot milk and still my voice was a horrible croak like this. And I kept coughing and spluttering. And some rather nice man in the class said, come on, we'll all concentrate on Colin. And they thought he was joking at first. And then they did it. They sat there, and I just sat there in my chair, and the whole class went into a sort of meditative condition, obviously concentrating and mad on me. And, you know, I talked for two hours with an absolutely perfect normal voice. I didn't begin coughing and choking until after the lecture. <laughs> it, it, quite, it quite clearly works. We possess what Howard calls the unit of pure thought, and it really works. In other words, there is a basic sense in which we are very, very close to it. And all we have to do is to realize how close to it we are. All we have to do is to generate that peculiar trickle of, you know, we're winning. Kind of two down, eight still to go. That feeling, you know, that suddenly obstacles are beginning to disappear and everything changes. Let, let me finish by evoking again that image that I used at the end of my book on Wilhelm Reich. In fact, the image came back to me years after I'd written the book on Reich as intensely significant. I'd been in Tokyo and they'd been dragging me around to no plays and other sort of similarly boring cultural activities. And at the end of a couple of weeks of this, I felt absolutely sick. And I was doing my best, you know, I was sort of swimming away, but <laughs> getting waves in my mouth. And um, at the end of two weeks of this, we, they took us to some modern play, some modern group. And really, it was awful. It was sort of, you know, Samuel Beckett, only ten times worse. <laughs> and um, as I was crossing the road, uh, it was a road with barriers on either side. There was a traffic light down at the end. And the cars in Tokyo drive at 99 miles an hour. And the our interpreter grabbed us by the arm and said, quick. And we scrambled between the barriers, and as we ran across the road, the lights changed, and this car came was zooming down towards us at a tremendous speed. And I thought, my God, you know. And I grabbed Joy by the arm and dragged her through the barrier, because although I was feeling so low and bored, that I felt scarcely any motivation whatsoever. I still felt, you know, that it would be sad to lose my wife in Tokyo. <laughs>